Thank you, everyone. Very nice to be here. Before we start talking, we'd actually just like to set the scene with a little bit of a film, I believe. Yeah, I think we have a... Uh, need to switch screen then. Once again. Yeah, I think we, um, just to introduce Kurpa Hosk, we're uh, turning 10 years this year, so we um, made a, like a showreel compiling the last 10 years. We're going like, to start kicking off with that showreel just to give you an idea of who we are. That's us. <laughs> but my name is uh, Martin Stenberg. I'm a creative uh, writer and strategist at Kurpa Hosk. This is Jonas. I'm Jonas Klerup. Uh, I'm the client, and I've been working with Kurpa Hosk for almost, almost 10 years as well. And my name is uh, Thomas Kurpa. I'm a co-founder and creative director at Kurpa Hosk. And at Kurpa Hosk, we have been working with brands and uh, experiences for the past 10 years and uh, are now basically not very tied to any industry, but quite agnostic, working all over the world, uh, but based in Stockholm and in New York. And our contribution to uh, the world of design and business is, we feel, in the meeting between artistry and strategy. We believe that uh, whatever we do, if it's an art project or if it's uh, work for a large uh, commercial company, the real value that we can bring to the table is when we combine the linear and the non-linear thinking, the, the creative insights and the strategic insights. Because ultimately, we're all living in, in an experience economy and we are only touched uh, by things that really reach to the core of us. That's our belief. So we believe that whatever we do, uh, we always have to make an impression and make that impression count. So that's our founding principle. And that's something that actually has been um, growing out of uh, several different insights and projects, several of which have been done together with Jonas, who has a solid background, as you heard, uh, within the arts. And that's really where we have explored this concept of business artistry, which we then brought into many of our other projects as well. And uh, they include all kinds of companies from blockchain to cosmetics to uh, vehicles to uh, uh, drinks, basically. So the foundation is business artistry. And uh, when we met you, Jonas, you had a first project that we, got, that we sunk our teeth in. Uh, you mean the gallery? Gallery yeah. business. <clears throat> 
Yeah, I opened up a gallery in 2006, I think it was, and after living many years in London and doing lots of different things with antiques and music and set design and everything. And I uh, was quite new on the scene, on the local scene in Stockholm, but had quite, uh, my approach was I didn't know anything about the art scene, didn't know anything about the gallery scene, so I could do it my own way, which turned out to be a success. I got a lot of attention, got a lot of buyers, because I, I kind of disrupted that, the, the kind, of, kind of conservative art scene in Stockholm at the moment. And quite early on, uh, I, I mean, me and uh, Thomas' uh, co-founder, Mons, are old friends since, since high school. Uh, so we got together, and, uh, and you guys were interested in rebranding my kind of gallery, right? Yeah, I think we had a fan, founding client, uh, Tele2, Tele2 in Deutsch. Uh, and that was a very big telco company um, operating in 12 countries. So that was a huge... Um, success when we actually could start with such a big client and then um, we needed something more like a source for um, experimentation, a platform for our studio to develop. So um, when we came across the opportunity to work with you, that was the first, I think the first time we actually could dig into graphics on um, like an, in the art scene in Stockholm at the time, which were also, many of the galleries were white boxes, quite um, uh, standard. Um, and it's still are today. A lot of, if you look at gallery web pages, quite fairly boring. I mean, it's the white cube. It's not much you can do. It's the same as the kind of physical space. But we wanted to do something completely different. And since I was kind of very kind of uh, aggressive on the local art scene, we felt let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's let that, uh, the graphic design also take that approach. Yeah. So we, uh, we had a quite a few years there when we played around, and uh, it was important also for an um, upcoming agency that Kurpahosk was at the time to have something to build a portfolio with. So uh, working with friends in the beginning can be a very good thing. Um, because and you and also I, think, I think also an another insight, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, is that uh, working with someone who actually has 100% trust in you allows you to really take things to an extreme. It doesn't always have to be friends, but it's uh, very crucial to uh, uh, successful collaboration, that it's a partnership, and I think that's also what you guys found. And I came from, I was very interested in graphic design from before, for a long time before, and architecture, so I really, really wanted to, to create this kind of, I mean, afterwards I discovered that I created a kind of brand on myself, I didn't know that at the time, I'd studied uh, interior architecture before, but suddenly I was on my own, I was, it was with me, and I was my own brand in a way, in Stockholm it came quite, I got a lot of press and a lot of attention, and since I was kind of loved graphic design and architecture, I wanted to work to incorporate that in the brand. So that's why I wanted to kind of say, okay, let's do, do whatever you want, do crazy stuff. I, want, I would say yes to almost anything. But we had, I mean, of course, we had different briefs. I mean, each, each exhibition, you have an exhibition per month, and each exhibition, I mean, the artist is in focus. But still, how do we kind of, you know, make a statement, uh, even though we're going to showcase the artist is going to be in focus? So we kind of worked with different typefaces for, for every exhibition, right? Yeah, so we, mainly the, the, the only constant ingredient we had when it um, comes to toolbox was the logo type, and then we were quite free, as you can see here, with typography and um, a lot of different new things um, each time we did a flyer or a, a new poster for um, exhibition, so that was so much fun, and also a good like balance between the more corporate side with Tele2 and Convic and all the telco things that we're doing. Um, so uh, this was uh, very important for us. And another, another insight was also that, you know, whether you work with Jonas Gallery or you work with Pinterest, you have to uh, create a setting which lifts the actual content. So it's in a way a co-branding exercise. How do you create something that is distinct but doesn't overtake, you know, the main focus area? Uh, this, I mean, it's also, it's also kind of... Um, created inspiration for the architecture. For the first space, we redid the architecture with an architect called John Robert Nielsen. He had done a lot of interiors and a lot of kind of gallery spaces, but he, he felt that I had a very kind of open approach to the whole kind of design process. So we actually did the gallery space with no uh, angled walls. And I think he took inspiration from, from, from the type, uh, the logo that Thomas created. So all the walls in the gallery space had this kind of rounded corners, which you can never see in the gallery even now today, I mean, so it's the so kind of whole design thing, kind of it, the architecture and everything into one big yeah. package. So, um, working with Clearup uh, Galleriet, and we still are doing that because uh, you're doing a small pop-ups now and then, but also 2011, we 
started a new uh, collaboration um, with Jonas as well called Villa. Uh, I felt that um, I wanted something different. It was very kind of traditional, everything, and the kind of art scene was very traditional, and fashion was very popular, and kind of so I wanted to kind of incorporate that and bring art out because art was not very trendy at, at that point. And I want to bring art in front of people to kind of to put it where the kind of the fashion stores are. So I had this idea of creating kind of a store where you sell art and prints um, on the on the high street of fashion. And uh, since our collaboration with the gallery was so successful, uh, this was kind of a discussion that came up together to kind of do it also and to incorporate uh, architecture. So we brought in a firm called Boys Don't Cry, an architect firm in Stockholm that Thomas and the guys have been working with before. And the three of us kind of uh, sat down and just kind of started with this concept, how to, what to do and how to do it in a way. Yeah. So um, it was kind of an experiment again to see if we can democratize art and also the way we buy art. I think a lot of people, especially young people uh, in Stockholm at least, were kind of afraid going into the established galleries. So it was also... Um, a way of trying to make art fun and uh, accessible. We, yeah, accessible. And also, uh, we had a, you know, the price range was also um, spanning from like very 50, cheap to yeah. 30 euro to, to I mean, 5,000 euro. Yeah. So, and I think this uh, is basically very, I mean, the environment here or the, the retail um, furnitures and stuff was very cheap yeah. as well. And Stockholm is very trend sensitive. Uh, at the point we did this, photography was on everyone's lips. It was a, opened a big kind of photography kunsthalle. So everyone was talking about photography for like, when I, when I told them I work with art, they said, oh, photography, you know, that's a new thing, right? I said, no, it's been going on since the 80s, 90s, but it's a local trend here. Um, but I think we were actually almost 10 years ahead of time because now contemporary art is the latest things everyone wants in Stockholm. Uh, so photography is not that hip anymore. So I think, uh, I mean, this project is going to continue, uh, I think hopefully later this year as well, to kind of to take form to a kind of uh, edition gallery, selling editions online uh, with the same kind of approach. And this this uh, um, idea of pushing pushing the envelope a little bit to set trends, I think, is also something that drives all of us at Kurpa Hosk to really look at um, every uh, project as an opportunity to try to move things forward uh, and hopefully set new, define new standards. Of course, we don't always manage to do that, but it's our ambition. And I think in this case, we worked apart, uh, also thanks to you, in reshaping the way that you look at contemporary art in Stockholm. Yeah. So uh, the identity um, was pretty straight on with this. Uh, we usually um, try to find in the toolbox, if you, we're going to come to that later, but if you uh, divide the toolbox into different uh, areas like uh, elements, we usually try to uh, establish one or two hero elements that you can work with um, and be quite free with other elements. So the other elements can be more periodic or change over time, but you have like a beautiful, like a jewel in the box that you can use uh, for many years. So uh, this villa logotype was, um, for us at least, the, the jewel in the toolbox. So. Uh, We've been doing stuff for Villa over the last 10 years, and uh, hopefully we can do something more now in the upcoming year. So this is just an example of that. But now to the main subject for... Yeah, for and we were actually sitting that, uh, last week discussing, like, how did this actually start? And I think we all had different stories around it. But somehow we ended on discussing the trend of curation, yeah, uh, sorry, just, just so funny, because when we got the uh, question to come down here and speak about uh, a case, that was very, like, we were very honored. Uh, we've done a lot of cases and, and a lot of projects, but um, seeing the lineup with all the agencies from Germany and, and clients like uh, Volkswagen, uh, DHL, or Bayern Munich, and then we have our, perhaps our smallest client um, from Körper Hosk, FOMO, and um, we were also struggling a bit to... to uh, Explain what it is. What is it? Yeah. I mean, it started out um, after I closed down the gallery uh, five years ago and been freelancing ever since, doing some pop-ups with Villa and curating, writing, tons of creative stuff. And this was an idea I did together with my, my colleague at FOMO, which is Pontus Janayev 
who is an uh, interior designer, he used to be a TV host in the 90s. I remember him from the 90s, you know, from Flow yeah. TV, when he did a lot of funny stuff, he's sketches. A, he's a really funny guy. Yeah. And, uh, and we started talking about, uh, I think it's come a bit with age, what you miss and what you kind of, you know, how, how what your people are doing, what your friends are doing, and you're not there, and depending on, you know, your family and kids and stuff. And in combination with that was everything we found online, you know, how everyone's kind of, you know, the internet, everything is so open, there's so much out there. And Pontus was so good in finding those kind of, kind of weirdest, strangest music videos. And, you know, how do you find those kind of things? And I want to see them as well. And our friends want to see them. How, how do we kind of combine that today? And that's how we got started talking away. Well, how shouldn't we create something, a kind of a hub or a platform for where all this kind of a creativity can be seen and you don't have to kind of leave your couch to be part of what you want to be a part of. And that's also when uh, <coughs> two guys said to you, well, uh, you're experiencing FOMO. Yes, yeah, that's yeah, what it is. Yeah. Um, What's so the name? Yeah, so we started out uh, like a live stream broadcast in a way. And this was uh, a kind of a program was supposed to be live streamed so you can sit at home and take part of being out in the club and the opening. And in the same time, before we kind of launched, we uh, approached Kurpa Hosk as well because we had, I mean, so many collaborations. And I'm probably the, the, the client that uh, they've gained least financial success from, but, but uh, a lot of kind of creative success from. Um, so we have a lot of kind of uh, very kind of good uh, collaborations. And I think also fear resonates with Thomas. I remember that when we were designing our office, you gave the instructions to the architect, like it should inspire fear and awe, right? Fear and uh, respect. <laughs> fear and respect, sorry about that. So it's uh, quite funny, and um, I mean the whole project has been like a playground for us. Um, and all of your like all the col collaborations we've done with Jonas has been uh, perfect in that sense that we can experiment, we can play, um, and also try new software. And that also gives um, something back to our bigger clients because they like that we are doing this kind of uh, experimentation, but we can also take learnings and insights from this uh, more experimental field into more corporate stuff. So that's a beautiful kind of a circle that we can also use in the studio. And I think that uh, one of the other things, speaking about curation, is that another founding uh, idea when you came with FOMO was that uh, everything is happening at all times in many, many, many millions of channels. And sometimes, you know, especially if you're uh, in your, from the 90s, you can miss the time when you had limited channels, but complete creative freedom within that channel. So that was also something that we very loosely discussed in creation, creation of this platform. Can we, um, can we limit the amount of channels to one? Can we narrow that perspective in order to broaden the discussion and then broadcast it to more people, which oh. is basically what curation is about. Yeah, I mean, the idea is still, we're still working on this idea of how to take to the next kind of level, but the idea also evolved a lot in those kind of discussions we had together because we didn't know what kind of idea we wanted to do. We started out as kind of a YouTube channel streaming live from festivals, from openings, from events and stuff. But it was throughout the process uh, when we kind of discussed those kind of things together and we kind of looked at different graphic solutions. We started with lots of kind of live uh, moving images in a yeah. way. Uh, and it kind of evolved. I had actually a hard time understand uh, <laughs> the first time you came and explained the idea. But we have actually a video for you. So you perhaps have, um, it's easier for you to get a picture of, of, uh, of FOMO. Vi är FOMO TV. Kondenserad kärlek och kompakt disco. Eh, konstnärer, designers, musiker, skådespelare, ja, filosofer och it-folk. Det här är bara för den inre kretsen. Ja. Eh, Little Jinder, Josefin, hej. 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 I got my picture taken with John Baez. Åh, oh, wow. Morten, hej. Hej, Jonas. Yeah, thank you for having me, I yeah. appreciate it. Uh, Vi sitter ute på krogar, på klubbar, utserveringar, yeah. festivaler och, och sänder live. Där är det. Så dammsuger vi verkligen Youtube för att hitta de här bra klippen och fantastiska musikvideorna. Och framförallt så vill vi veta vad våra gäster, vad de tycker själva. Men vad är det du har valt för någon? Jag har valt... Uh... Don't you want me baby? Jag kommer till vår värld. Tack för ikväll. Mycket är uh, Till internet, till internet. So for you who do not speak uh, Swedish, maybe you missed a part of it, but there were a lot of artists uh, passing by there and uh, discussions about uh, clips, art and life. Yeah. And YouTube, I mean, what's out there? And uh, <clears throat> talking to uh, creatives about 
what they, I mean, the, 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 the interests also lie in what does, what, what do you want to see, what do you want to see, what, do, what are you inspiration of, and to, together to come to find that what other creatives are kind of inspired by and what they like to see, look at. Like, you know, like everyone talk, discusses Netflix movies or the series online. This was more about finding your kind of special, oh, it's a strange documentary about this kind of graphic designer in the kind of 40s, and it's there, and to kind of collect all those inspirational. Yeah. So it, it was, in that sense, also connected to the things we're doing at the gallery and, and villa, so like a natural extension of that. Um, but it was very hard to capture like your idea in the beginning, and uh, we had also a struggle when it came to the identity because we didn't know what it was, and still perhaps don't do. So um, the first discussions we had when it came to the identity was, uh, uh, again, can we have this like a playground, uh, both in terms of identity, but also in terms of ideas, test new ideas, uh, have fun, and also perhaps in the, in the long run, see if we can come up with new business ideas as well. So uh, usually uh, at Kurpa Hosk, when we start doing uh, explorations, we uh, um, try to see if we can find some hero elements in the toolbox. And, and this toolbox is common. It's, it's like every identity is built upon this at least four elements. Logotype, typography, colors, imagery. Sometimes you have a fifth element, like uh, Adidas Three Stripes. It's an extension of the logotype. Still, it's not the logotype. It's something that you, ha you reckon like Adidas from, from far distance because it, they're so famous and they derives from the logotype but it's still it's not, in, in that sense, um, a logotype. And then, of course, in some bigger projects, you have icons, illustrations, infographics, UI, UX, stuff that can also be related from the core uh, of the identity. Everything is like connected to each other. And um, we usually try to, we usually start with the core elements at Kurpa Hosk. We don't do like concepts or like this world. We want to do something like this. We turn it around and work more like pure graphics from the beginning to see if we can find um, simple, strong, and unique ideas that we can extend into a concept. So it's more like we regard these elements like ingredients in a dish, for example. So when you have the best meat in the world, you can do a lot of different concepts or recipes. So we also try uh, to find connections between the elements. So, for example, if we come up with a logotype, uh, we try to extend that into the typography so they have a very clear connection. Uh, as an example, we work with Bobby Brown, and we uh, have recently just updated the, the logotype you can see in the, in the lower right corner. Um, and they have been changing typography for so many years, like every, every year is a new typography. So there was an opportunity in our eyes to actually extend the logotype into a typography that you reckon as well, like you can see they can own their own typographic expression. So that's something we usually do. And, and uh, we can also uh, sometimes take another relationship between, for in this example, like logotype into a fifth element, like the Adidas example. We did that for a client called Wrap. Um, and we had the box um, because they, they came from an old logo with the, something that's wrapped around the box. So we tried to simplify the box into um, perfect triangles. And then you get the 60 degrees uh, math, which we built a logotype from, a W. And we can also, uh, from that, design numbers. So uh, it's quite nice when you are like you're forced into a dogma or something that you need to solve problems within. So you have another example here where you see where we extend the logotype into something um, fifth element in this case. So they have a very clear connection. So we do that a lot of things for them, and, and as you see, we can also extend the, this expression, like the angles, into lines, like these posters. So we've got numbers, logotype, everything is connected. So that's the beauty of it, to, to really find a very simple idea that you can extend and, and dig in within that uh, idea, do a lot of, lot of stuff. 
So in this case, the design DNA is the low type into numbers into whatever. But in this case, we were talking about perhaps we could do something much more free. Um, so um, we can have much more flexibility. We can like change over time. Also regarding um, the idea you guys had that the company could also evolve over the years. So we're not stuck into like a corporate uh, idea of what FOMO really is, because no one knew and knows, I guess, what it is. So um, we were um, thinking of perhaps we actually can have just one constant, um, a low type. And everything around the low type could be changeable or periodic. Um, and usually, I mean, like Nike, for example, Nike have two hero elements. It's the swoosh and the Futura. Um, the imagery have been changed over since the 70s. And, and today, you know, the core elements or the heroes are the same. But Nike are always like um, contemporary, always follow time, because they can change the periodic elements, uh, like colors. Even though the boxes are perhaps like red or orange, everything else is changing all the time. So that's um, something you can do when you have very strong heroes. So if we can have a very strong hero, perhaps the hero as well, can we, can we push it even further, see if the hero can change as well? So um, the fact that FOMO also was a so small client is also easier, I guess, to be pushing limits. Um, and I think... Just like a reflection, for many of you guys here are in school, I think you should, I mean, the opportunity you have in school to experiment and come up with like fantasy clients or fantasy projects, that's something you should take in and, and bring into your profession after school as well, to always be like inventing things. Because if you just sit and wait for like briefs, I think you're going to be perhaps struggling um, to develop or like getting, um, taking the next step. So I think that's something we at least try to do all the time to invent stuff or like come up with own personal ideas or projects or brands. So uh, that was the beauty of this project as well, that we can have another opportunity to experiment and, and uh, bring oxygen into the studio. And we, and we try to interpret uh, Pontus and Jonas's original idea and find you know, a way to kind of define it. Since it was so loose around the edges, we, we landed on a, a couple of words um, that we wanted again to narrow. Again, today, if you have YouTube, you have Facebook, you have all kinds of channels, we would like to like, narrow the scope so we could focus in and create a platform, which could be a YouTube channel but, or a magazine or whatever. But we would do that in order to broaden the uh, content available, because today most channels are dedicated to one topic. You're a gamer, you're a food geek, whatever. We wanted to take the old flow TV logic into this. Uh, and then we wanted to broadcast it to the world using design. And that was a starting point. And it also led us to back to the 80s and the 90s and the, the era of the VHS cassette. Mm that we grew up with, and all, of course you have, we have all, always had the MTV logos in the background and how we kind of used with, you took VHS tapes and, and kind of, uh, you were, in a way, because the buzzword uh, for the last couple of years has been curator, uh, it comes from the art world, but now you have curators for festivals, you have curators for food, curators everywhere, so there's education about curating, and curating, I mean, it comes, of course, in a time where everything is out there, it's so much in a way. So you kind of you need those kind of uh, curators to to decide for you what what you want, and I think that's what something we wanted to kind of to do and to kind of enclose something that I mean, we, we're curating the content in a way, but from there we need to kind of have open open arms yeah. and vision. I remember like when I when you were watching, uh, you know, Flow TV in the '90s, you had a channel in Sweden called Sata TV. There was only one channel, and you couldn't watch it after it was done but they had all kinds of weird stuff going on there. And the only way you could capture it was on a VHS cassette, which is a very imperfect medium. It only catches glimpses, and then you accidentally over-record a piece of it, then it breaks. It was also kind of an aesthetic, I could say, that, that kind of inspired the next step. Yeah, so we basically took the Adidas stripes, 
um, and did something new with it. No, but it was uh, the three words was very like central for us to see if we can um, come up with um, you know the core element um, from that, and uh, we wanted something based on something very simple, like uh, almost like a code or um, a mark that you actually don't understand, uh, which makes sense regarding your business idea as well. Um, so this was the foundation that we want to establish. And around that, perhaps have some periodic elements um, into the logotype as well. So we were inspired by this camera lenses and the eye. So FOMO could be something like changeable, even like the first element, the core element can change uh, and be something also reflecting perhaps the subject or the, um, the project we're doing at the right now or like uh, for a specific uh, purpose. So uh, these like stems or like uh, F and M should be constant and in, in, uh, within or around that we can change over time. So we were experimenting a lot with different circles or like eyes or lenses or could also be um, like content or anything more or less that are circular shaped. So uh, that was fun for our designers to experiment and also um, getting into it's the first time actually we were, went into code, to, to uh, code uh, design, uh, like processing. So also very fun to explore things that are quite hard to do in uh, like Illustrator or After Effects. I think this is inspired also the content that we can, uh, me and Pontus, uh, put out on the channel. Uh, since when we kind of, though all those kind of evolving things happen, we kind of want to focus even more on uh, on the design that Krupa Hoska done because we felt it, it it became so kind of uh, it the whole kind of pr the whole project grew together with uh, those kind of uh, design thoughts. So the whole kind of idea with FOMO uh, evolved to become a more kind of design-driven uh, process, I think. Uh, and after a late night, you came up with another idea for us to experiment in, in processing. So this one is quite, uh, quite special, but still very beautiful. But I guess also it's all about you know, trying to push the envelope, like we said before, and we try to do it with most of our clients. Of course, you don't always end up with the result that you would ideally want yourself. Look at that. Sorry. Well, thank you, Thomas. <laughs> um, dissolving FOMO, dissolving fear of missing out. You're missing yeah. out. So, when we, sorry to interrupt you, Martin, but when I we did all this exploration, we did actually to show you guys, uh, you and you and um, Pontus, how this logotype could look like or uh, be used in motion. We did a, a movie for that for internal use. <laughs> We used this uh, movie in uh, clubs as well. I mean, on, on uh, yeah, screens. Yeah, applications because FOMO kind of evolved from being this kind of live stream channel into, I think, last year we had it as a kind of pure kind of almost music video and YouTube-related uh, website where we presented one project per day, and also worked with some kind of clubs uh, of doing this uh, more VJing where we, we used a lot of this kind of graphic and the language combined with uh, vintage videos or something as a as the projection for events and clubs. And yeah. Now, and now we only have eight minutes left. There's some juicy Eight minutes, bits. I need to uh, run a bit here. Um, then, uh, as I said, we just had the, the logotype was the thing that we want to have constant. And, and then we worked in, in, initially we had in this NB, as I think that's Neubau, pronounced correct, Neubau, in Swedish, uh, Nybygg International. So we worked with that like um, framework uh, quite free. Um, 
but and also like um, trying to have these indents, like like pushing in. Um, you see as well, we have like grids that are very neat and tight, and also work with different. Uh, this is KS Grotesque uh, Kurpahosk own font that we're introducing now, is just to test. So it's not like we're stuck into Neubau. It's more like experiment, uh, continue to experiment. In the beginning, we were a lot of into uh, these old 80s colors from the VHS systems. Uh, so that we can also mean for question now when we're entering the new phase of FOMO. The imagery we had and still have is quite unique, I would say. Um, this is Pontus doing experimental stuff. Yeah, that's my colleague Pontus, yeah. Yeah. So this is on uh, FOMO uh, Instagram. I just love the story that Pontus wanted to pitch this to a big beer, brewery, beer. <laughs> and it was, it was absolutely convinced that they will buy this for hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> it's so, so good. I mean, not everyone saw his vision. No. I still think it's right, though. We yeah, still, we'll see, we still yeah. don't have a beer sponsor. No, <laughs> no we're trying still. I mean. And the first year, uh, just to stress things here a bit, um, Transmitting audio and video, of course, we were talking a lot about this VHS aesthetics. So that was also a very good brief for the first product in the studio. What can we do with um, this uh, old school uh, graphics? Very beautiful um, source to dig into. Um, so we tried to update the, this language with very clear references to the 80s. Um, and we did a lot of um, different explorations. And it was just interesting to see how much from your childhood you actually explored again in terms of visuals. Uh, a lot of like um, bad um, pixelated, uh... pixelated images, um, just having fun more or less. So that's again something I think um, is good to, for agencies to, um, to mix. And, uh, and uh, I think as well, like experimentations like this are feeding other clients as well. So it's a win-win system. So we did a lot of different explorations, as you can see, and still are pushing. And I guess I have like 300 the... of these. So I just need to click a bit, Mark. Yeah, uh, you right click your head there, Thomas. You're doing a great job. And meanwhile, we could say, Jonas, <laughs> what is the next FOMO? Uh, the next step, I mean, both me and Pontus are working on uh, different projects as well, as part of this is kind of our baby. Uh, and we are in talks now, we're talking with you guys about uh, how to explore the third kind of step. What do we want to try out now? And I think we're, it's, it's going to be something that's uh, going to be online, like if we're like an kind of flirting with old television, but um, in an online presence uh, on the web page, right? With lots of moving images and a uh, mixture of strange stuff. It's going, to be, it's going to be amazing, I think. Yeah, uh, and maybe we could even create you know, a, a set of dogmatic principles and invite other people to experiment it. Yeah, yeah. And also even creating kind of code or something that people can program themselves for an app or something. We're, we're not yet there yet, but we're just we're in discussions now. So, so some examples from uh, where we are now, um, trying to uh, articulate the ideas Jonas is talking about. So next step with FOMO um, is, again, to keep this um, low type, you can see, coming in, and then just experiment with new uh, elements, new periodic elements. So. Uh, we're on a, um, a journey now to see where we can take it. Vielen Dank. Thank you.